Hi guys, welcome back to Hair Dryer Treatment. I'm absolutely buzzing for tonight's show. A very, very, very special guest, MBE, gold medalist, master chef, amongst many other things. Centre forward, as <laughs> he was just telling us off camera as well. Greg <laughs> Rutherford, thank you so much for joining us on tonight's show. I hope you're doing well. Yeah, well, thank you very much for inviting me on. I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, you know what? It's, I'm really looking forward to it. Like I say, it's very relaxed. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to bouncing off the chat as well. I'm sure we'll have plenty, plenty of questions. And of course, we're joined by the lovely Meg. Meg, how are you doing? I am very well, thank you. Those who are normally here or have been with us will know that I've been decorating. And this is what I've been decorating. The plain white walls. After all very this true. week, all this week I've been working on these. So I thought I'd best show them off. Look how white they are. <laughs> you know what, Meg? I didn't... When she came on, I thought, I didn't even look at Meg. I saw the wall and I thought, wow, that, that's some really impressive painting. <laughs> Tell you what, all week I've slaved over this wall. <laughs> I feel like I need to go down, because we just had one of our bedrooms downstairs, well, I say bedrooms, so one of our main rooms downstairs painted, uh, blasted, sorry. So I feel like I need to go downstairs and uh, and show that off now. Hang on, no, I'm not going to, it's, it's awful. But you see, I, I know how you feel with, um, with house renovations and whatever else is, uh, takes a lot of time. Absolute nightmare at times. But it looks lovely. Your white walls look absolutely wonderful. Thank there you. Are. That is just what I was after tonight. That's it. Finish the show. Love <laughs> <laughs> right. to see you guys. See you later. <laughs> I love how Meg has actually moved her normal location for a video just so she could get that wall in the video. I love that. <laughs> <Definitely. She's moved. laughs> well, as you can, sort, you can sort of see here, I've got like a bed. This is a bed frame purely because the house is being renovated. There's nowhere else I can go where I can hide from the children long enough where they're not going to come charging in, jump around or whatever else. So here we are um, in a bedroom upstairs, hoping that we don't get gate crashed by two little kids. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. We should be safe. Don't worry about it because Meg many a time has been bombarded, haven't you? Bless you, live on stream. <laughs> I have. No I, have. Behind I, did, I did actually watch Greg's interview with, uh, was it, was it with BBC, Greg, when your children oh, came yeah. in? And I thought... <laughs> Oh, that's relatable because that's what my children normally do. <laughs> Come charge oh, me. it was it was an absolute nightmare as well. I mean, again, on BBC <laughs> Breakfast, and then they just I, the thing was I get, I'm trying to do that classic like no 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 eight go eight go eight go please, and they just bounced around. I was like, what do I do? <laughs> what are they sort of walking? I, I just had to carry on. Just had to hope for the best. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Just keep going on. Just the show goes on as they say, doesn't it? Oh, really? Absolutely. Just keep going. But a lot, we've got a lot of a lot of things to get through. A lot of things that we would like to talk about. Obviously, I met you in London um, yeah. a while back now. Found that obviously you're a big Manchester United fan, so we will be talking about Manchester United because you know that's why you're here. But before that, we want to get through a lot more content. If that's all right with you, and I want to start Absolutely. by saying, obviously, in lockdown, as many people are struggling. Um, a lot of mental health issues have been going on. I know you did an article very, very recently. And on this channel, we do like to talk about it. And of course, today is International Men's Day. So I thought this would be a really good time for us to tie it in. And obviously, we've got Greg on. And I think it would be a really good topic. So obviously, in terms of mental health, Greg, I mean, what advice would you give to people who are struggling in lockdown? It is really, look, we're in unprecedented times as it currently stands. This is something that none of us have ever had to deal with. And obviously most people in the world have never had to deal with, even the older generations. So it is a really new thing to, to be having to, to get to grips with. And obviously lockdown is an incredibly difficult thing. And this is obviously where a lot of the major issues are stemming from. And I think obviously when you're taking away people's ability to do their normal day-to-day -day lives, things like depression and other mental health issues can really start to set in. Um, and what I've sort of found, and I've been involved with a, a couple of campaigns during the, 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 the lockdown period, and it, it seemed to be that, again, staying active is a really, really important thing, first and foremost. And, and during the, the first lockdown, obviously, the weather was far nicer than it is now, um, but we were yeah. heavily restricted. I mean, we're in a situation where you could what, go an hour a day. That was it. And you had to really be quite clever with that hour of, of what you were doing in order to make sure that you were sort of getting yourself out and about and doing something that can work for you. And, and I think what is important is that you find when you are training, when you are moving, I mean, I say training, it's a very loose term. It could be going for a walk if you are into running or whatever else. Difficult, obviously, if you like playing football because you can't obviously get together as a team. But genuinely being active, keeping yourself physically and, and, and mentally, mentally active is hugely important in, in maintaining and keeping a, a level body and, and, and mind. Um, and then finding other things that you can do. So something I've been re involved with really recently um, is, a, is a thing I was doing with the car, which basically was talking about 
baking and cooking with with your children or with your family or, or just taking it on as, as a bit of a hobby obviously we're all stuck inside a lot of the time um and we obviously had the yeah. situation where everybody bought up all the flour in england um i mean there, if you were trying to make banana bread when that buzz kicked <laughs> off there's no there's no flour anywhere left so there, there was a lot of it out there but what is obviously important in those situations is then actually you do something that again is challenging and cooking and, and baking things that that's that's something that, that really can help and, and again if you are part of a family it's a lovely way to interact with, with the youngsters um that's what i i do with my two boys and, and it's things that you've got to keep yourself busy it's a very difficult time it's difficult for everybody and as long as you can stay really really physically and mentally active as i say in the times that are there it will really help combat that and look there is a bit of light at the end of the tunnel as we currently speak we're talking about uh, immunizations and, and there's a chance that that even could get rolled out before Christmas so the hope is that obviously things will go as quickly as possible there but if we can stay active we can stay physically and mentally switched on then hopefully people can get through it and look the most important thing out of all of that reach out to people as well if, if you do find yourself in a situation where you're really really struggling then you have to reach if you can't reach out to family and friends there are different places that you can go to which you can find just online etc to speak to somebody about it that's hugely important i think we really echo that me and me and Soph and i have previously just said to you off off air that you know we do like to talk about mental health on here it's it's um it's something that we have personally both experienced you know not ourselves but with with friends as well um mm -hmm. what i do really want to talk about and, and you don't often get to say this very minimal people get to say congratulations to an olympic world medalist a gold <laughs> medalist at that so i'm just going to take my opportunity to say oh my goodness that is absolutely incredible so oh, i want to i want to go right back um you've probably spoke about the olympics so much in the past Eight, eight years eight years um but and it's probably very hard to sum that moment up but if you can in just a few few words you can have a few sentences Oof. i'll let you off what what was it what was it like at london 2012 when you got that gold medal oh goodness me i mean and that is you, a couple of sets that's very difficult that's being a bit that's being a bit cruel to be totally honest um look uh, imagine the one thing that you've you've always wanted that I mean be that scoring a goal for Man United or whatever England or whatever or going on doing for me from a youngish age it was about achieving the, the best I possibly could in a sport and I loved football played a bit of rugby badminton whatever so I was determined to find a sport that worked for me my first sporting moment is watching Linford Christie win the 100 meters in the 92 Olympics now I feel like neither of you were born in 92 so that oh, makes me feel a little bit oh yeah there you go that's good we were, so uh, I was probably, well, I was May 92, so. I was just, you were just born. That's saying, good. You were both yeah, just, I was just there. <laughs> <laughs> well, just having my birthday, I'm starting to feel really old. But look, I, I had that that as, as one of my first, that is my first sporting memory. And the Olympics then became hugely important. So to then step out in London in front of a home crowd on a night where I was sandwiched between two of Britain's greatest ever athletes in Jessica Ennis Hill before and then Mo after me. To then win it, it's one of the hardest emotions to describe. It is every single wonderful thing I'd ever dreamt of. Suddenly, I'd achieved that. And to try and, again, express it, you can say things like, it was incredible, it was wonderful, it was amazing, it was life It was all of those things, but it was also more. But then on that same note, the most overriding feeling that I had at that point by the way I know I've gone way over a couple of sentences here um, <laughs> <Thanks. I'll carry laughs> on. the overriding feeling that I felt was relief and the reason that was the overriding sensation was because for me that wasn't my first Olympics I'd, I'd been in Beijing four years before I'd been a professional athlete from when I turned professional in 18, uh, 18. so I'd been a professional athlete at that point for nearly seven years um, I'd had so many injuries, so many problems, things would always go wrong. I'd had coaching setup changes, etc. Finally, the one thing that I say I'd always wanted happened. It took place and I won. And I felt relief like no tomorrow. It was as if I could exhale and say, thank goodness I finally done it. I finally achieved something that I, I knew I, I felt that I was I was able I was, I was possible to do 
but I think a lot of people had, had completely written me off by that point. So to do it was was special and a huge, huge relief. Well, I'm like Meg. I'm just in awe. Like I'm, I could listen all day to these stories. Um, Alex <laughs> says, "Hi, Greg. Tell us about what, what we spoke about Super Saturday. You just spoke about that, but you also said, how did the home support help you in terms of winning the gold? I mean, the support from home. We're going to talk in a minute about the commitment of being an Olympian and how, how much work goes into that. But firstly, thank you, Alex, for the super chat. But also, how, how was it? How was home life for you at that time? Um, I mean, to talk about the, the crowd first and foremost. I mean, that that was. That was special, and, and and there's this one moment where the way it works for us in in, in track is that we warm up on a, a, a warm up track outside of the the major stadium. So you have your, your Olympic Stadium, which obviously now is being used by West Ham, and it's far better when we had it for athletics. Um, but there was another track that was sort of part of the car park now, I think it is, um, which we would warm up at what warm up on. Sorry, and then what happens is you're you're sort of taken into a pen. And then you're fed through into the stadium. So there's this there was this moment where I'm standing in the tunnel in the far corner near where we would walk out, and I could just see the crowd. They couldn't see me. I could see what was going on. And and there was this moment where on the big screen in the far corner, which I could see, Jessica Ennis was was flashed up for a second while warming up, and the crowd just went mad for a second. And then wow. I walked out in this line. There's 12 of us that make the final. I walk out in this line. And this really weird moment sort of took place. I mean, I guess it's similar to when you walk onto a football field, really. So it's very, very similar in a major stadium. As you walk, we walked out from the people that were sort of around this, this sort of archway area as we came out, this rippling effect of cheer because they, they saw myself and there's one other Brit in that final, just in the British jersey. I mean, they obviously didn't know who we were at that point because I, I'd never won anything. Nobody was really talking about me to win. But this rippling effect of cheer just as we walked out and on the Tano it announces men's long jump and then the person who's talking there is saying that there's two Brits in it. It took my breath away, like genuinely took my breath away. And, and I had this sort of moment where I felt myself tearing up for a second because everything has been about this moment. It's about competing in an Olympic final for me. I mean, look, in 2005, we'd been announced as the, 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 the host for the 2012 Olympics. At that point, I was a junior athlete I'd been going on this, this journey the whole way through with the desperation to be there. I was now there and I, was, I had a chance of winning. And this crowd, as I say, it just, it was unbelievable. And then there was moments during the competition. So again, the beauty of what we do in the field events is that you effectively, you have your turn, if you like, and then you're walking back, you talk to your coach for a moment. It's very different to things like tennis because you can interact with your coach talk to your coach, you then walk up. And, you, and when you're walking back to where you sort of sit, or in my case, I sort of would lay on the floor quite a lot to rest my old back, um, you're walking past the crowd. So the crowd will shout things at you. Now, and again, the, the nice thing is it's not like football, I guess. They're not shouting I was going to say, you see, I was about to ask that. I was going to say, get him up, get him up. So, you know what I mean? We're going to get sacked in the morning. I mean, do you know what? I'm just trying to think. I don't think I've ever been heckled um, in a stadium as such. I've definitely been heckled elsewhere, but uh, I think generally, even in other parts of the world, they're really good to you. But what you find is that they obviously cheer louder for somebody of the home nation. So for us, obviously in London, yeah. it was always about us, but there was these moments and there was this really weird moment. I think it was after, I think it was after round two where I'd then taken the lead in that Olympic final. And, and again, obviously the crowd all goes wild, everybody ch shouts and cheers and I sort of a bit of a fist pump, all that sort of stuff. And then everything starts to calm down a little bit as you're walking back up. I've had the chat with my coach, Dan, and then I'm walking up and then there's just this one voice came out and he just said, this is your time, Greg. And it, again, it was, I didn't know the person, of course, like it was just somebody watching in the crowd. I, I heard it. I noticed it. I acknowledged it. And it was a really powerful moment where, again, somebody, and he, he, that person probably had never watched athletics before, but he had no idea. But those words that at that, that time he chose to use for me, it, it was, again, very, very powerful. And it just gave me that extra edge where I, I, I started to feel like no matter what anybody did on that day, this was my time and this is my opportunity to win the ultimate accolade. And I will do everything in my power to do it on that day. 
That's crazy. I feel like I wonder who that person is. I, would, no, I feel like we yeah, need to well, put out the, no now. If you are that person, <laughs> please get in touch because I think Greg wants to say thank you. <laughs> I would. I would love to know. And actually, I'm, I'm pretty sure there is a sound bite somewhere on the coverage where it, that's picked up on a camera as well. Um, so I, I think that it's possible. I, I, I'm pretty sure one of the times that I've seen the little sections back that it's picked up somewhere and there's there's a little nod to the crowd from me. Um, so there's definitely, yeah, it, 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 the person's out there somewhere. I would be fascinated to know who it was. <laughs> Love that. They, um, Go on, Meg. Oh, go on. I'll read this one after you. Go on. I just want, when you talk about the home nation and obviously you giving them giving you such a boost, at the moment there there are no crowds at football yeah. stadiums. There are, it's, it's sporting events massively. Obviously the Olympics got postponed this year. Yeah. I personally don't see a full stadium for a long time with the way things are going at the moment what do you think or how do you think that's going to affect the olympics athletics in terms of like you said that one person shouted to you that it was your time and that kind of instilled this momentum for you there's not going to be people there well how do you think that's going to affect olympics or athletics it will really affect it, yeah, I mean, and it already has. And what, what's very interesting is we had the World Championships last year in Doha and sadly over the years with athletics, I mean, I think in all organisations there's been some dodgy dealings that have taken place and I think sadly Doha receiving the World Championships wasn't for the good of the sport at all because it was in a place where really athletics wasn't particularly popular and what we ended up seeing is Dina Asher-Smith, who is now Britain's key athlete in track and field and is truly a special world-class athlete. She becomes a world champion in an empty stadium. And it was empty purely because, it was nothing to do with COVID obviously at that point, it was empty because there wasn't any desire for people to be in that stadium. And it felt hollow, it it, it, re, it was missing something. And we're all experiencing it when we're watching football at the moment and any other sports that we're, we're, we're currently watching. But that was an experience of it when there was no reason for there to, to be nobody there. And it didn't feel, it didn't really feel like an, a world championship winner in that way it was it was really really odd so going forward now i'll be totally honest for a long time now for the last few months i, I was meant to be covering the olympics for eurosport um so i, I, I was so fortunate that they, they've basically they've taken me on board that they, they wanted me to, to become one of their pundits if you like and and i was very excited about the prospect of being in japan and covering the coverage for them and talking about etc now i i didn't believe it was going to take place at all I genuinely thought there was going to be no hope of getting everybody in a position, but conversations that we're now having behind the scenes, and obviously the talks of these vaccines, et cetera, there is a chance now that it will go ahead. And my belief will be for anybody who can go into that stadium, there will have to be some form of vaccine that has been, um, has been administered to them. And I, I think Japan in particular is going to do a massive, massive job in order to make sure those stadiums are as full as they possibly can be. Because I'll, I'll be totally honest, without the fans, the Olympics will not feel like an Olympics at all. And the athletes will find it very, very difficult. Now, someone like myself, and I can only talk from my own experiences because I, I can't obviously put words in other athletes' mouths, but I loved a stadium. I loved a big crowd and I loved the opportunity to perform. And that's not an arrogance thing. That's not nothing else like that at all. But there's something about when you are doing the thing that you love and you're doing it on the biggest world stage. You want people around you. You want people cheering you on and you want them giving you that extra edge like we just talked about in London. So if they don't have that in, in Tokyo, it, it will be a very, very different game. And I feel like the athletes will, will probably struggle with, with a lot. I've competed in competitions before where the crowds were awful or they, they didn't turn up. And it's hard to get yourself motivated, even though it is an Olympics or a World Championships or whatever else. The crowds are, for most of the athletes, one of the best parts about performing in, in these big stadiums. So the hope is that they'll figure it out. If they don't, it's going to be a very, very different Olympics than what we've ever experienced before. Yeah, it's true. And I, I think, on, on, not only for sports, obviously, I think across the globe, I think everyone should, wants to get back to normality. And like you say, the vaccine, fingers crossed that that does um, help. And fingers crossed it does get sorted before Christmas, because I do think now football as well. I mean, we're going to talk about Manchester United in a minute and the home form and whatnot, but I do think crowd plays a massive part, doesn't it? Um, 
I was going to read a few chats if that's all right, Greg. So this one is my dad, surprisingly. Yeah. Um, he's, he's a big fan. Yeah. And he said, Greg, can you give us a little insight into the training from when you started out and when did you decide that long long jump was your sport? So firstly, like, give us a little bit of insight in your training routine, let's say, on a daily basis. Like, how hard did you have to train? Yeah, it, it's, it's always funny. When I, when I talk to footballers and everything else, and they all seem to finish by about one o'clock and they'll go home and play on yeah. Xboxes or whatever else they do. They <laughs> definitely seem to... I picked the wrong sport, I think. I think that's for sure. <laughs> um, so so for me, I, I mean, I'll, when I was training, I used to train America as well. So I spent half the year in America and, and the other half here. Um, we trained in, in Arizona, and Arizona is obviously a lot, a lot hotter than it is here. So for speed, power-based events like what I did, it makes sense to be in the sun. Um, but in the lead up to, to London, Barca warm over training camps, I was in London, I was training in London. So for me, it'd be a case of getting in the car, I don't know, for about half eight in the morning, get into the track by about half nine-ish, then start warming up for 10. And um, we basically trained through from about 10 till three or four. And then at that point, then you're done again. Now within that training block, it would all really, really vary. So you'd have situations where, Ironically, you couldn't jump that often. Now, and this is the funny thing. Obviously, I was a long jumper, and everybody goes, "Oh, you must have been jumping all the time." In actual fact, um, we were able to jump probably once a week, maybe twice, because there's so much impact that goes through your body. And I, I had to, like seven operations during my career to try and fix the bits of knobs that kept falling off or going wrong. And that sort of gives you an idea of, of the sort of force. And yeah, bits genuinely at times were, were just sort of hanging on, if you like. So. What we'd end up doing is so we'd probably jump once a week. I would sprint up to for maybe four times a week. Around that would be plyometric workouts again, so box jumping, jumping over hurdles and things, and then lifting in the gym. So weightlifting was, was a relatively important part of, of again, the strengthening of the, the general body in order to, uh, to give you the opportunity to, to jump. Um, and that was, that was for me. I, I, look, I always talk about this because I think everybody expects you to, to, to say, look, I trained – all the time, I lived like a monk. It was like a monastic lifestyle, and all I did was was train or sleep. And, and I think that's actually a healthy way of approaching. I think that's how we burn out. So I would take off a Thursday and a Sunday every week to to recover. I had so many injuries in my early career that I, I had to find out what would work, what the balance would be for performance um, and training load. And actually, having an extra day off, which was my Thursday, meant that I could perform better. Um, so that was that was something that, that we had to figure out. We had to work towards, um, and I made sure when I wasn't at the track, I was completely switching off, and I was thinking about other things. Because again, I think it's very easy to obsess, especially about sport, because again, you love it; it's physical, everything else. But it can have such a negative impact on, and again, your mental health in particular, if it's all you think about at all times. Uh, so yeah, so for me, the training load was a lot of sprinting. Um, jumping once, maybe twice a week, a lot of weightlifting, um, and then a lot of general circuit-based stuff, and then eating basically protein and veg, and that was it really. So th the food side of things were quite boring, really, um, but the training, the training side, I absolutely loved as well. Oh, yeah, what, and what, um, this, what was the next bit? What was the next bit that you did, from, did as well? Oh, my dad asked you when when you knew that long jump was the sport for you. Well, that, I quite like this one as well because that is, is a question that you get asked and it's and it, I, I like it because I think this is important. And, and again, I, I've got children and look, I, I don't know whether or not they'll do sport to a high level at all. There's no pressure from, from me at all for them to do, to do sport at a high level. I just want them to enjoy it. I want them to stay active and, and be physically active just to, to stay fit and healthy. But what I think is very, very important is something we get very hung up on. And I saw it when I was in the football system before I was in the athletic system. I saw how damaging it can be when one sport is truly all encompassing of your entire life. But it's not just your life, it's then your parents' lives and everything else. And I think it can become such a negative on a child because what ends up happening is it's all or nothing. And I saw very talented athletes, general athletes, play football that never quite made it in football but then decided to do nothing because that's all they wanted to do. Now, the difference with me was... I played football to a relatively high level. I, you, you may have, I don't know. I, I trialled at Aston Villa at around 13. Um, they're doing all right now. And they're all right back then. Obviously, I've had a bit of a, a lull for a while. Um, and obviously, I, the dream would have always been to play for United, but I was not good enough. And thankfully, I knew I wasn't good enough as well. 
So I never had the chat. Now I remember I was there for about nine months trialing on and off. And I remember seeing boys going to the, the, the car park with their dads or mums or whatever after guardians, after the training coach walk up and go, don't come back next week. As brutal as that. And watching their lives just fall apart, crying in, in, in the, the, the car park, their parents crying, everything else. Now I think, my parents saw the writings on the wall and took me out of that. So we, we walked away from football. I wasn't enjoying it as much. I was traveling up to near Birmingham. So I'd be at school all day. Then I'd be traveling up to Birmingham to then try and train. And I wasn't really in it. And around that, I was also, I was playing, I was all right, all right at rugby, not, not, nobody was good at football, but I was playing sort of county level badminton as well. I'd also joined like the track team. I was sort of doing everything, but, but it's the one thing I would say safeguarded me going forwards because I tried so many different sports I actually gave myself the opportunity to find the one that would work so the one common denominator that I had with all of these sports was that I was quick so I can run quite fast so stick me out on the wing or an inside outside center on rugby I'm generally going to score you a couple of tries I'll be knackered and I'll probably have an asper attack and have to stop after a couple but at least I've got a few points on the board when I played football I was generally I was, I was always up front and it was kids football get the ball over the top I would always skin a defender and then nine times out of ten one on one for keeper you score although probably in my case it was maybe five out of ten um because definitely uh, once I got that, that that final touch was a bit like a, a hit and hope if I'm totally honest at times um and so with with that I then went to the the the, the athletics club and then I, at the athletics club I quickly realized outside of Bucks where I'm from I wasn't as good as like some of the guys from say Manchester, London, Birmingham, whatever, I was as quick. Tried the long jump and then here we are. And it was as simple as that. I try, I was always, look, winning for me is one of, well, it was obviously when I was younger, was one of the most important things. And again, I'm a huge advocate of everybody trying sport and being involved, but winning was what it was about for me. It, it, I, look, I love participating, I love being involved, but I, I was that kid when I played football, if we lost the game, I was crying at the end of it because it meant so much to me. I just went, look, we got, I mean, we had, we had a really good local team. So I'm now, I'm now waffling on a lot here, but we had a really sort of no, really no. good local, local <laughs> team. Um, we're called Bletchley Colts. And this was sort of, this must have been, when are we? The sort of 99, 2000 years, so I'd have been 12, 13. Um, we'd done really well in the, in the area. We'd made it, I think, to the Easy Cup Finals, East Angular Cup Final back then. Um, lost on penalties, actually, as well. And I skied one over the bar. I hated taking penalties oh, as a no. striker. I was one of them. <laughs> and again, cried my eyes out. But anyway, we then went on this tour of, of uh, Holland um, playing football. We were playing against like some of the like, Ajax youth team. Cup teams came in from Germany and Belgium and things as well. We went to the semi-final of this tournament as well. And we, I think we were playing as like an under-14s and we were under-13s. So and nobody expected us to do well. But there's this picture, and I wish I had it here. I don't have it here. And the whole team's obviously over the moon. They made a semi-final of a tournament. And the one kid on the corner, the little ginger kid, was me crying. Cry my eyes out because we hadn't won the tournament. And that, that was just how it was for me. And, and as I say, I then found the long jump. I found that I could win at that. And look, I mean, obviously there's some natural ability and everything else, but I then in the latter part of my teens into my early 20s, obviously worked very hard in order, to, in order to achieve. But I had to go through that process, trying all the sports, and then I, I landed on on the long jump. Amazing. Um, before Meg, I finished Latoya, and actually it's what Meg is going to ask you in a second, but Doug said, what did you make of this Strictly experience? So what did <laughs> what did you make of your Strictly experience, should I say? So obviously, Strictly, oh, yeah, take it away, Greg. Hey, was it? <laughs> still gives me heart palpitations that does dear oh dear um do you know what they 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 sell it to you in a really different way they say look you only have to train 12 hours a week be really good fun you, you'll be you'll be great at it whatever else good lord were they wrong so i trained probably 10 12 hours a day um because i was so like i i thought i was awful at, at the thing like i i tried so hard and I am a I am a triad with most things that I do and I was determined not to go out the first week on it, of it so literally I just killed myself all week every week in order to do it so my experience probably wasn't as fun as as probably other people because I was so I knew I'd never win it and I knew I, I knew like there was genuinely no chance but I was I just didn't want to be crap that was basically all it is I didn't want to be rubbish so um 
But yeah, it was it was different. And you know, really interestingly, and I think this probably shows a little bit about again my the way my mind works and my mindset leading into things. When I was truly happy on that show was the two weeks that I was in the dance off. Because there was something about you're back against the wall again, and I have to perform now to stay in this. And I used to love those moments when I was competing as well. If I'd had a couple of bad jumps, uh, oh yeah, don't, we're, sorry, I've just seen that flash up there. Don't watch me on House of Games at the moment. I was awful on that show. Angela Barnes is on there as well. And she is, she's like a freak of nature. She is one of the cleverest humans I've ever met in my life. So yeah, I'm awful. Please don't watch me on House of Games. Um, <laughs> Um, Strictly was um, Strictly was a fascinating experience, and seeing how it works, and seeing something as big as that. I mean, it's the BBC's biggest show. We were averaging, I think, eleven, twelve million people a week watching, and that gives you an idea. In, in, in UK UK TV terms nowadays, that that's massive because uh, because obviously we have so many channels to get that that amount of viewers is huge. But I, as I say, I truly enjoyed my time when I knew that I was possibly going to go out. And it wasn't because I was going out, it was because I, I love those moments when I, I have to I have to perform. You're forced to perform. And I loved it. It was that, that was the good, good part of it. The rest of it was really hard work and, and I moaned a lot. Th those moments were, were the best bits. <laughs> you did make it to, um, you made it to Blackpool though. Did, you did make I did. it to Blackpool. I did make it to yeah. Blackpool. Yeah, good knowledge. Yeah, yeah. or probably just read it. Um, <laughs> no, no, I'm quite like, I'm quite, I'm quite a strict, strictly girl. I could quite like a strictly girl. Yeah, oh, I do quite okay. like it. When they can, um, when they can obviously do it with a crown and everything else. I mean, well, Blackpool's. Where, where are you guys? You guys are based in the Manchester area, aren't you? Like you, you, um, you can show like Black. Well, I mean, I mean, it's not a million miles away. Like it's closer than you are, obviously, yeah. than me. You get yourselves, get yourselves up to Blackpool next time it's on because there's a lot of seat in there, and it is amazing. Like you see. You see the show in all its glory, and it, it really is special. Like it is a special show. So to make to make it to Blackpool was, um, yeah, was amazing. But I was rubbish. Like I just so I just tried hard. <laughs> I, I've got a little girl who likes all the sparkles and sequins. Oh, bet. So Let's so go. she would be made up. But there isn't obviously there is another show going on at the moment where uh, your Olympic counterpart Mo Farah who won on Super yes. Saturday is taking part now my question would be would you swap the sequins for the slugs because would oh. you like to go on would, could you could you go on I'm a celebrity would is that something you'd love to I, do or is that something you'd I, love to just be watching I've always said no so um and it's purely because I'll be honest I'm pretty good with most things but I'm terrified of spiders and it's like an irrational fear and I hate that I'm afraid of them. And I've got better probably in the last year. I can hold a spider that's probably the size of a 10p or so. Um, and I can throw them out. But obviously, you know, like what we get, you know, like those well, wolf, like wolf spiders, whatever, house spiders that you get all the time, the massive ones. Yeah. I, I'm useless. If I see one of them, I'm just, I'm no good. And I, I mean, I can just about get a cup on them sometimes if they're not too big, but I'm, I'm, I'm useless. And I know what would happen. And I said it when I've had meetings about it before. I know what would happen. That would be released. I would have to do every spider challenge going and I would just probably yeah. cry. That's what would end up <laughs> happening. And I don't need to be seeing cry my eyes out because there's a spider <laughs> on my face on national TV. So I've always I've always said no. But look, now there's now it's in a castle and I love a castle. Maybe in the future we'll see. But um look, I love I a thought, challenge. I thought you were gonna say a spider as big as your hand because you got your like I could see you with your hand there and then you came <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> well that's the thing it is an irrational yeah. fear as well like it really is an irrational fear and, and it annoys me so much but like if i move something and there's a dirty great spider behind it like i like i, I, ugh, like, I really freak out and i'm like right i'm done if i'm like moving things in the garden and there's a day i'm like that that kills it for the day i'm like right i'll come back another day when hopefully the spider's moved out to, to somewhere else <laughs> My dad's taking the mick out of me and saying, Greg, can you give my daughter some tips so she dances like she's moving a wardrobe? But I'll be honest, you're pretty accurate. Pretty accurate. <laughs> <laughs> dancing like you're moving a wardrobe. Greg. That's brilliant. <laughs> oh, I'm going to use that. I'm, I'm definitely going to use that to everybody now. <laughs>
Um, big thanks to Adam for the super chat. It's a great show again. Greg, what is the atmosphere like when you stay in the Olympic Village? Is it quite intense between the other athletes? Obviously, Meg's just mentioned Mo Farah. <laughs> I mean, do you get to spend a lot of time, though? Do you know Mo Farah quite well? And also, what is it like between you and other competitors? Yeah, I've roomed with Mo a couple of times and things over the years. Um, first time would have been back in 2006, I think. Um, and then actually we were roomed together in Rio. Uh, but Mo was, Mo was, um, I think he was staying somewhere else ready for, for the race and whatever else. Uh, but we spent time together. Yeah, great chap. Really, really interesting. Um, the, the Olympic Village, now it is a fascinating place and it's the ultimate grounding, levelling place uh, of, of all sports. Because obviously what you find there is that you might have the greatest tennis players in the world walking around. You might see football players as we did in, in London as well. And, and that was actually, that was quite a, a good one for me at that time, because obviously it's before I competed. I'm just a, another small, quick anecdote. Um, Ryan Giggs was, was eating dinner in the food hall. And obviously as a United fan as well, at that point, I'd never met any of these guys, particularly at that point. It was really, yeah. it was a really weird and odd moment to see an idol growing up sitting, just eating his, porridge or whatever he was eating the same as everybody else but I'd seen exactly the same in in the previous Olympics and things and again someone like Michael Phelps or Rafa Nadal some of the the greatest sportsmen and women ever in the history of the of, of sport in general are just kicking about and and it's not it's not as it's not as weird as you would you would think in the way of even though they're superstars, there's a level of respect enough where they're not crowded constantly, people asking for autographs and everything else. And there is the odd one, of course. I mean, you've got to remember about the Olympics, which I think is the truly amazing thing, is that it, it, it really does bring the world together. So you have people from all over the world who have never seen certain things or have only ever seen things on, on TV, all of a sudden in a foreign country with some of the greatest sportsmen and women, as I say, in the world. So there is obviously the odd bit, but generally there's like a weird, you have just have like a weird nod to people. Cause it's like, they obviously know that you know who they are and they have no idea who you are, but you're, you, you don't want to lose it entirely. So you're just a bit like, you know what? Yeah. Good to see ya. Yeah. Well done. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Play it cool, and just play keep it going. Cool. Yeah, but, but there is no special treatment. So again, if you are Ryan Giggs, Usain Bolt, Michael Phelps, whoever it might be, you're still queuing up with everybody else to get your food. You're still then trying to find yourself a seat. You might be looking for your mates, whatever else. It's it's one of those things that you're in the village, you're walking around, you're seeing people, and of course that you are also seeing your competitors at time, at times, sorry. And and that's an interesting one. Mostly I was always friends with most of my competitors. One or two um, I wasn't massively keen on. And you just don't really speak to them as such. But it, it's a really weird melting pot of, of genuinely every culture and civilization coming together, living effectively under the same roof, eating foods. Now, an interesting thing about this. So what they do is they bring in this company, I think it's an Australian company that sets up this massive tent where you can hold 6,000 people at one time. And in there, you've got food from around the world. I mean, it is a, like if you like, to, I love food. Like I'm, I'm big into my food. That's hence why I weigh about 10 kilos more than I did as an athlete now. Um, I love food. Now, you get a chance to try all these different amazing cuisine. And it is, it's made by local people from different countries, obviously to suit people from around the world. But the one thing that there is there, uh, which is brilliant, in the middle of all of that is a dirty great McDonald's as well. So you're in this massive tent. You've got all this food from around the world and you've got a dirty, great McDonald's as well. <laughs> and you always know if you, if you were to be dropped off and you didn't know what day it was or what time during the Olympics, what you do is you look at the queue for McDonald's because if the queue's massive, you know you're heading towards the end of, of the Olympics. If there's nobody in the queue for McDonald's, you know it's the start of the Olympics because basically people finish, they're done, they've, they've had their time out, out in whatever stadium doing it is. And then everybody just flocks to McDonald's. It's um, <laughs> it's hilarious to see. So, and, and the other thing is as well, obviously, because what we say, there are people from around the world. There's people that have never seen a McDonald's before. So to them, they, it's like this restaurant. It's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go to McDonald's. It's this really famous American restaurant. So you'll just have people just eating McDonald's all the time. You're thinking, that's not very good for performance. So uh, yeah, it, it's an amazing, Again, it's an incredible place. It, it is truly a village inside this bubble, which is the Olympic Games, which, as I say, is, in my opinion, is the, the greatest sporting event there is, just purely because it brings everybody together from around the world. And it really is inclusive. Something like 212 or 216 countries are in an Olympic Games. 
uh, somebody's at least represented as well. And obviously it's it, men and women as well brought together. And, it, and again, it's the ultimate leveller. And I think that is, is a truly mm. wonderful thing. You know what, the Olympics, like 2012 in particular, like I was going to take my eyes off it. I loved it. I found myself watching sports I'd never even heard of before, but I just absolutely loved it. Like I was just so engrossed in it. And like you say, this, like the atmosphere around the UK, it just felt so positive from the Olympics. Yeah. Like everyone was just lifted from it. Everyone was buzzing to watch it, getting back from work, sleeping it straight on. And I just love yeah, the atmosphere that it creates. It's really, really positive. But in particular, 2012, like I say, because of it being obviously held in London and whatnot, it was just so nice for the UK. But we've mentioned that we've got to talk loads, loads of positives, and then we're going to get onto Manchester United. So we're going to get to that Manchester United <laughs> topic right about now. You've chewed that up, bro. You've chewed that up very <laughs> yeah. well, yeah. Uh, I will also say, guys, if you've got any questions for Greg, please pop them in the chat as well. We'll get through as many as we can. But firstly, Greg, Manchester United, right now, this current period of time, how are you feeling about the club? Do you know, just really sad, I guess. And look, I think we're obviously very spoiled and we always have to look back. I think we're all of an age where we grew up loving a club that was obviously incredibly successful as well. Now, I'm from Milton Keynes, so I'll obviously get stick, the fact that I'm a Man United fan. I'm, I'm obviously not from the local area, but I, I, I always find that discussion absolutely binary and pointless. I think it's a ridiculous discussion to have. You can obviously support whoever you want. But I've, I've had to have a lot yeah. of stick. But being from Milton Keynes, you've ever supported Man United or Arsenal. And who wants to support Arsenal? Come on. Um, so look, we, we've gone through this period where we have been so fortunate to, to have a structure in place, which meant that we could we bred and we were so unbelievably successful. So to then come out the other end of that and then go through this this sort of... And, and it is on one level turmoil. Now, you speak to fans, obviously, of clubs that are maybe not in the premiership or no one here was good, not had the success. And they're like, oh, look, you, you're moaning about the fact that you're not winning as such. But just because certain things changed at the club, i.e. David Gill and, and Sir Alex leaving, doesn't mm -hmm. mean that the club should drop away, if that makes sense. The way I see it, the finances are still there. there. There should have been and should have been kept after Sir Alex left a, a core group of, of staff in place in order to hopefully seamlessly continue with a level of success. But what I feel like we've seen as they've left is just a complete scattergun approach and a, and a bit of a hit and hope. And it feels like a level of maybe arrogance from people within the club, which have actually meant that the way things were have not been maintained and look, it wasn't that long ago that we were still a successful club so to see where we are now it it's difficult and it's obviously painful at times to be so inconsistent but to still have arguably some of the world's best players in, in certain positions on the pitch but unable for some reason is what we've sort of done we, we've sort of we, we, we've sort of created the England team that everybody believed would always win and of course look, I'm not trying to say certain players are as good as the greatest and what, what I mean is we've got some very, very good football players, but they don't seem to gel enough to be consistent mm -hmm. yeah. in order to, to continuously win. And we, we saw it, obviously, when we had the great England team where, obviously, <clears throat> we talk about Scolzi, Gerrard and Lampard. It's always the conversation that's always had. Of course, Paul Scholes is the greatest ever midfielder, so um, there's not really a discussion to be had there. Um, but, I, and, 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 I mean, yeah, exactly, there, there's no discussion really to be had. But what we had was a level of division within an England team full of stars, which meant they never quite performed to, to where they did. Now, I'm not saying there's division as such, and you hear rumours, of course, but there's a situation where, as it stands, the players that are there who are truly world class in certain cases are unable, for whatever reason, to maintain a high level of playing week in, week out, when other teams who, on paper, don't have a, a, a squad as, as good as United now, are managing to do it. Yeah. Now, look, we, we can talk about, we, we, you have interviews and it will say, we didn't have the crowd today and, and we're really, really struggling with that old traffic because obviously our home form has been absolutely diabolical. I don't buy into that. I, I, it's... It, it, <sighs> It's the same for everybody in that situation. Now, listen, obviously, we talked about yeah. earlier about how I would find it difficult to perform in, say, an empty stadium, whatever else. And I'm sure they do find the same. But it's not as if they've gone one week to a ram stadium to the next to an empty stadium, which is what would sometimes happen in sport that I did. And then you feel a bit flat. 
We all have to yeah. adapt. Footballers have to adapt. It is their job, of course. So I don't believe the players see it as maybe strongly or you would want to use it as an excuse because they know other teams are doing well. And so it's a very long-winded answer to get there, but I think you always have to set it up. But look. I was going to say, it's well, a hard answer. <laughs> no, it's really hard to answer. But fundamentally, we are inconsistent when on paper we shouldn't be inconsistent. And, and that's the big thing, I think. We've got a situation now where squad depth is obviously significantly stronger than it had been within the last couple of years. Players that have been brought in, possibly not always the, the perfect players. But there's now a, a squad, and I just saw van der Beek's name flash up for a second now yeah. I think that's a prime example that that's a big discussion at the moment of course and and obviously i know some people and some people on tv obviously as well turned around and said hey he wasn't a, a player that, that that united wanted or ollie wanted but look we were playing andreas Pereira, who in pre-season would be the greatest player on earth for for Hello. five minutes and and then exactly and that's the thing and then was i mean it was it was painful to watch at times and obviously a lovely guy and this was the, the other thing as well Look, what we have to remember, I think we have to always be very careful, and Twitter is a vile place at times. These are all still yeah. humans, and these are these are all people who are doing the thing that they love, and you cannot blame a player who has been employed by a club, who's paid a contract and has signed a contract because the club has asked them to do so. This is They've not gone there knocking on the door, begging, saying, please yeah. give me something, please give me something. There, there, there goes this. You, you can't hammer them for the fact that they're not good enough at times and again they're probably all very very nice people as well so you have to be very careful there but fundamentally the squad has not been strong enough to challenge in any way shape or form we are slowly getting there but there are levels of inconsistency which don't make sense now the buck has to fall on somebody eventually and i feel as if we're, we're starting to get towards a situation where we'll we'll play against PSG and win the game and then everybody's going, this is amazing, to the following week, you can hardly kick a ball straight. Yeah. Players don't become bad players overnight. And you can obviously tell what I'm sort of getting at a little bit here. The way modern football is, is that if you cannot get a group of players and very talented players to play well together, generally you don't last very long. And of course, I would never, ever want anybody to lose their job because it's a very... It was an awful thing. And of course, you want stability. And, and we came out of a period of very good stability where you're, you're successful. But we've trialed different things. They haven't worked. I think most people, when Ollie came in, I think we were excited about the prospect of, of ridding ourselves of what we had previously. And obviously, the irony is now that Spurs are doing real well with Jose. And we'll see what happens and how long that lasts. But we are in a situation where they're not playing well enough together. Yeah. Often it's hard we're to, seeing things. It's, it's hard to say. I know things because I'm I've just one hand I've just said Twitter is full of vile people often say awful things, but equally you you do get a good barometer of of people that are there. And look, yeah, of course, it's not everybody from the Stretford end who's there gonna be there right up. And of course, when United when Old Trafford is full United on, on pitch, everybody supports them generally, and that, that's, a, that's how as it should be. But there are definitely situations where you're watching a game and you're baffled. And of course, we're not there week in, week out. We're not there watching them train, etc. But it's baffling decisions are made where you you feel as if their decisions made more because that person's possibly worried about, I don't know, maybe their job could be on the line or whatever, and they're playing it overly safe. So at that point, you're, you're sort of going, is that the right person to be leading a club as as huge as Man United? And, and again, it's really difficult because he's such a legend. And, it, and and obviously, nobody will ever forget that that goal to win us the Champions League. Like, nobody's ever going to forget that, right? But I, I always yeah. say this. I always say this from the point of view of of, of, of my career. Because again, I can only compare it to my... I'm, I'm not a professional footballer. I'm a professional athlete. Or was a professional athlete. I retired at 31 because I, became, I I got some injuries. Now, I could have carried on. But the problem is people would have started turning around and saying, oh, he's rubbish now. Do you remember when he was good now? It doesn't matter because he's rubbish now. What I fear, and there will be a certain sect of, of the United fans now who will view Oli as the manager opposed to the player, and that will now taint part of his legacy, um, which I yeah. think is a monumental shame. Um, but look, what... <laughs> 
what is the answer? This this is the thing. We're, we're in a situation where, it, as you just said, so it's like it's a really hard question to answer. But we yeah. could bring in another manager. People are touting Poch, Allegri, whatever else. The squad going to respond to it. You don't know. It's different now, isn't it? And this is the other thing as well. Things have changed in, in professional football. It is difficult to judge what will happen. But currently, I don't know or if I, I don't maybe okay I don't have confidence that it's going in the right direction and I've just given you about a 10 minute answer for something that could have been a lot easier sorry <laughs> <laughs> you um you spoke about that 99 goal Greg and I've so just put it up was that your favorite Manchester United goal ever or is there a, or, is there, or is there another one that, that stands out no do you not know, no I, I think for me and I, I, I think probably the age of that I mean, that and it's right up there, it says top three without question. It was really important. And, and for me as well, the Champions League was always an amazing thing in, in, when I was growing up. It was the one thing that I would sort of watch. I, I sort of came from a family where we didn't have a lot of money, so we didn't have things like Sky and stuff, so we weren't really watching all the games week in, week out. Um, so then when the Champions League was obviously on ITV, um, it meant that we were always watching it, which I, which, I, which I obviously loved. And I'd go to like friends' houses to watch United games and stuff, which was, which was really special. So, yeah, of course, that is a very, very special game. But there's something about Giggs' goal in the semi-final against Arsenal. And everybody talks about this. And, I mean, first and foremost, we have to talk about the fact that he took off his, his shirt and had the hairiest chest on earth at that time. <laughs> yeah. But like, there, there was something... <laughs> Exactly, but that, that that becomes almost as iconic as the goal, to be honest. But I think as well, because football was, was, was such an important... Yeah, exactly, just going around. It was such an important part of my life then. It was it was probably the most important thing in my life, sporting-wise. And again, for me, in the area that I grew up in, and, and I sort of still reside now, Arsenal fans are pain in the backside. So for that to take place, it meant an awful lot to me. And I just remember just, just, yeah, just everything about that. Somebody taking on the ball. And, and again, I say, because I was playing football at that time as well, trying to imagine yourself. I mean, we've all done it. And you guys would do exactly the same, especially when you're a kid. You'd be watching the football and then you'd be like reenacting the goals. You'd go out in the, in the garden or the park, whatever else. You'd try and reenact what you'd just seen. And trying to comprehend what had just happened was just out of this world. To, to do what he did. It, it just it impacted me on such a level where I was like, God, that's really impressive. Like, it, it was it was like that. It was like, oh, there's all these things. I mean, like, remember like Tony Yaboa obviously scoring like his, his epic goal for Leeds off of the crossbar in. Everybody always talks about like the crossbar in goals like from that sort of thing. And you sort <laughs> yeah. of go, yeah, it's doable. Because like you hit enough at a goal, you're going to hit the crossbar and it's going to go in. But having the ability, as he obviously gives you to take it around players as he did and score, you just, it, you really, realize at that moment that there's something very very special about certain players and yeah I found that incredibly special you know that goal like for me what was so special about it is when you watch it if you watch it back the ball barely moves the ball pretty much goes in a straight line like Giggsy should get on strictly himself because his hips are moving more than the ball <laughs> and, he's moving, and he's trying to see in the defenders but the ball's just rolling and obviously a terrible pitch but yeah and that, it's just a great goal, great goal. The fact that Vieira passed obviously gave the ball away as well. I thought it was just class. Um, oh, thank God, you so much for so the super chat. Uh, Sorry, yeah, how I think you're you having a problem with it. <laughs> oh, it's fine, it's fine. We've got quite a lot of questions coming in, to be fair. Some really interesting ones. But this one, it says, how does an Olympic athlete generally cope with completing an event outside the medal positions after they spent four years training? I mean, you've worked so hard, Greg. How, how would you sum that up? I mean, what are we saying, like, Competing in a competition and you're not winning a medal still. Is that is that sort of how we come in? Yeah, so you so, finished oh, outside of the medal, yeah. Yeah, so look, it, it's it's very, very difficult. And, and look, I, I spent a large part of my career, especially the first half of my career, not winning anything. Um, I think up until London, I'd won a Commonwealth silver medal and I'd won a European silver medal. Um, so I hadn't even won them. And it was the only two things in seven years that I'd managed. And I, I, it's not only become used to it, but when you're younger in particular, you sort of, I, th I think as much as you believe in your ability, you also see other athletes and you think, God, I, I don't, I'm competing for a second best here because I can't beat them. But it is very, very difficult when you turn up at a major championships and you believe genuinely you're in with a chance of, of winning and, or at least winning a medal. Now I, I had a couple of situations. 2011 was a great example. The year before the Olympics, I turned up in, in Daegu in South Korea for our world championships 
and I'd actually been having a really good year. I think I've won a Diamond League event in America, which is like for me, Eugene is like the home of an athlete called Prefontaine. You may never come. It's the home of Nike, obviously, and everything else. Um, really, really big event. And I managed to win that event. And I started to be, be sort of recognised on the world scene a bit more. Second round of the qualification, I run down the, the runway and my hamstring pops in half. And that was me out of the, the, the championships. So to be in that, that comp, travel all that far, all that way, so tra- and, and train so much for this one event for it to then yeah. go out in qualification, it's really, really difficult. And, and then you find yourself in other situations where, where you, you just cannot perform to the level that you normally would. And I, I had a situation again, 2013, actually, I, my hamstring was in half. I still decided to go to the World Champs again. World Champs every two years in athletics. And I physically couldn't run quick enough in order to jump far enough. And I missed out on going to the final by about three centimetres or something. And that's really, really difficult because, again, the what you then feel like at that point is why have I wasted my time? What an absolute waste of six months or whatever it has been prepping for this, this moment. What was the point in doing it? And at that point, it's really, really useful to have, obviously, very strong a very strong team around you to pick you back up again because the brain is an awful thing at times. Your mind can really play tricks on you. And you can start to believe that actually what is the point in doing these things? And I, I had that in my early career. I nearly retired at the end of 2007. Um, I, I, I didn't think I'd make the first Olympics, et cetera. I, I genuinely needed, I started looking for work again. So I, people always forget with me as well. Like I worked for the first few years of, of my life, younger life, came out of school, started working. I worked a few different places, whatever else. And then fortunately could turn professional. I was, I was earning sort of pennies when at the start of my career, but it was just enough while living at home that I could get by. So I, by that sort of two, three years in, and it wasn't going well, I was like, well, I just need to get a job, don't I? And, and actually having the people around me that I did, it meant I, I stayed on the right path um, and managed to obviously get here. But it is hard and it's, it's difficult. And we're sort of remembered by generally our Olympic Games. You can probably hear one of my children screaming in the background now. <laughs> it's cool. Um, it's, uh, they found you. They found you. Uh, you are, I, I have a feeling, they're, a feeling they're in the bath. And um, uh, yeah. <laughs> So hopefully, as long as they don't fight, we'll be okay. Um, but yeah, look, it, it is hard. It's re- it's genuinely hard work. But um, so that's when it's so important to have the right team around you. And actually, one of the most important people for me, especially in my early career, is my, my best friend Andrew, who's also an athlete. He's Olympic bronze medalist in the four by four relay. Uh, and having somebody who again believes in you and you're so close to, it, it genuinely massively helps. For real. Um, Alex, thank you for the super chat. He says, does Greg keep in touch with fellow athletes from 2012? And also, who is Greg's favourite Manchester United player from the past and from the current squad? So I'll start with the first bit. Do you keep in touch from athletes um, from 2012? Yeah, so you still see some from time to time. So different events, different shows and things. Um, Mo is difficult because obviously he's still an athlete, so he's still competing a lot and he's, he's away. So you very rarely um, cross paths with him. But when I do, it's always really nice and like he's a good chap. Um, Jess, again, based up in Sheffield. So you see ever so often. Um, and again, amazing yeah. human and, and an amazing athlete. But then there is, is some of the other people. So one of my best friends and again, roommate for most of my career is a guy called Steve Lewis, who's the, who was the British record holder in the pole vault. He now lives in America. So we, we go out to America in, in Arizona, and visit him every year, which is nice. Well, I can't at the moment, obviously. But um, yeah, there, there's a few. There's a core few of my, my friends because look, you become very close friends with a lot of the other athletes because you're with them all the time. Like your life and it's changed slightly now, but when I was a journeyman athlete in the younger years, you're bouncing around from country to country, living out of a backpack, going home for a few days, traveling again, training a bit, traveling again. So, and, and people struggle to understand that. So when you have friends, and I do this in very good, lots of normal friends, if you like, that don't, don't do sport, they can't really sort of bring themselves to understand why that's hard work, why that's taxi, et cetera. So generally your friendship groups become other athletes. So yeah, there, there's a, there's a core core few that I um I still speak to an awful lot, and uh, yeah, they're uh, yeah they're some of my closest friends. Brill. and um, your favourite player from the Manchester United? I'm going to say favourite player from Manchester United. Full stop. I'm not going to say currently. I'm interested to see who your favourite player is of all time. Um yeah, do you know what? Look, there's a couple of reasons why. Um now when I obviously I played up front, so it was a different position, but there's there's a certain sort of distinguishing feature about me as a person that most people will recognize straight away and it's obviously used in a derogatory term most of the time by most people 
Um, and of course, it is the fact that I have ginger hair. Uh, now, when I was playing football, I was always sort of just called like little Paul Skulls. Again, played obviously different positions and were very different players. He was good. I was awful. Um, but he, again, was somebody that when watching live, you appreciate so much. That's always a great thing when you're in a stadium and you get to see things off the ball. I think TV coverage is fantastic now as well. And you do get a really good overview picture of things. But actually watching the way players move, and I'm obviously referring to Paul Skulls here, um, and then maybe that might be seen as slightly cliche because, again, he's been obviously touted as one of the greatest players by some of the greatest players to ever play the game as well. But I really loved the fact that I was quite a shy ginger kid. And I think that is important to sort of mention when I was a young athlete, when I was a young lad as well. And to see that a man that was so incredibly talented at what, what he did in sport, which I loved, and then was also really unassuming and obviously never did an interview, was terrible. I love, I don't know if you, you must have seen this. There's like that footage of when they were still in the under 18s or whatever it is. And it's, it, it's, it's the Nevilles and it, um, Nicky Butt, uh, yeah. David Beckham, and then Scolzi there as well. And Scolzi does a bit of an interview. And it's one of the most awkward, cringy things you've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hilarious. And you're watching it and you're going, that's why he didn't like doing interviews. Um, but yeah, I say to to see that and and to, and look, you, you're often influenced by people that, that have you have a direct relatable fact with them. And and for me that Paul Skulls, especially look, in the nineties obviously that hasn't worked for us. Being ginger, you get ripped all the time. But I could always be like, Well, Paul Skulls is pretty good though, isn't he? Um so for me that was a that was it. Yeah, he, he he was a big player, and and again, obviously a pundit now. But yeah, it was incredible, yeah. truly, truly amazing. My favourite player of all time, Paul Scholes. I, I constantly say it, and I like you in the Olympics where you're all composed when you see certain players and whatnot, and you have to act, play it cool. I didn't do that when I saw Paul Scholes. Like I lost it. I lost it. I see, I, I've, I've seen that photo. <laughs> I've seen that photo. And, and he's still on. He's still on the phone. He went, to be fair, it was rude on my behalf, though. He, he was inside hotel football, and, and he, he, he literally just answered his phone. And I obviously clocked him, and I went running. I literally just ran over. Webby was on the door. Bless the security. And I literally pushed past Webby. I was like, "Let me have a picture quick." So I kind of just bombarded him. I felt a bit bad to have to, <laughs> I had to get a picture. But Saeed, obviously, it wasn't in United Stand. He he had a video of me running over. He's got the, the footage of me running over and getting the photos it's quite funny so yeah everyone's oh, like he's still on the phone they're rude to be and i'm like no it's actually me who's rude to be fair i, I jumped in on him but, um, well, I tell you, this, I tell this, you. this oh, is sorry, a comment it said this is for a bottle of water for greg you must have a dry mouth by now that's from twisted <laughs> thank you for the super chat <laughs> i appreciate that but yeah i, I was proper fangirl and i'm not ashamed to say it like i lost it it was like i sensed Would he was you... there it was, it was really weird <laughs> is, do you know what? So just a, a, re, a really weird thing on that point, and I think it does always show that, that how important football is to so many people. And there's the one time that I've really lost my core. And and I, I, look, again, I'm not going to start name dropping or whatever else. But I've since the Olympics, I've had some really uh, like genuinely unbelievable encounters with people that never in a million years did I ever expect to meet or talk to or whatever else. And they are genuinely like, it blows my mind just to think about that. But the one person that, again, I did exactly the same as you and really, really got quite sort of, I don't know, I could hardly speak. The Millies, so the Millies are the military awards, which um, the sun would always do. And they're much more prevalent when obviously we're at wars. We had the Iraq war going on for a long period of time, obviously. So the Millies became a really important thing, which is a fantastic thing as well to, to champion our armed forces, which I think is a very important thing. What I found amazing, so the Millies are supported by, again, real famous people. I mean, like real superstars from the world of film and, and sport, whatever else. But never in my life have I seen a room react to somebody as they did to David Beckham. And yeah. for me as well, him being who he is, it, it's different. It's not David Beckham, obviously the superstar of the world. For me, he's David Beckham, the United player and the United legend and everything else. And that 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 means that there's something different. But what I always found amazing, I remember at the Millies, he was walking from one end sort of coming round. And first of all, when he stood up, the whole room went quiet. It was bizarre. I've never, I mean, like Liam Neeson was there. I mean, obviously the, the really famous actor. Was like, who else there? I think Hugh Laurie might have been there that year as well. So like some really big names in in, in things. But no, like everybody's like, yeah, fine, fine. But he stood up and the whole room went silent. And 
bless him, honestly, people started then running to him to get photographed as well. So he's trying to make his way through. And every two steps, two steps, he, he's being stopped and started taking a photograph. And he took the time with every single person. He, he was incredibly polite to all of them. Anyway, he's coming closer and closer. And I, I'm on the table and I think people can sort of see it that, that I'm, I'm like sort of itching. Just be like, go say, go say hi. Like just going to, I was like, oh, I've, I felt bad for him anyway. I was like, no, do you know what? I have to do this. So I, I, I sort of went over and I went, oh, David, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I'm so sorry to do this. Can I have a photograph? And he went, he went, yeah, sure, Greg. No problems at all. How's things going? Are you jumping all right? And literally, wow. like, I, I couldn't, it was just a, uh, uh, I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, thanks. It's, it's fantastic. Thank you. Um, this is great. I, I, I went up about 18 octaves like had no idea, like didn't know what to do and I must look like the biggest moron on earth but having that moment but again he stood for the picture wished me luck and everything else and it was just incredible wow. incredible and again for me a very very special thing and, and so I don't take pictures with, with many people because I'm always too embarrassed to do it but that's special but I will get skulls at some point as well that's that's a plan of mine just don't, don't get him on the phone. That, that's my need voice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Arctic Central, that is actually Saeed. I just spoke about you, Saeed. I mentioned the fact that yeah, you recorded yeah. me running over to get the, the picture of the skulls. So <laughs> go and check out his channel. Go and hit the sub button. But Meg, Beckham, do you reckon you'd be fangirling if you ever got the opportunity to bump into him? I think my mouth would have to be picked up off the floor if I ever got the opportunity to meet. I was going to say to Greg, did your hamstring stay together when he went <laughs> running over? But David Beckham came towards Greg. The fact that he knew your name and everything, it was, what a dream. <laughs> Honestly, one of the weirdest. And, and I sort of forget. I mean, he was an idiot. I was an idiot, but he was always spent a lot of time with Jess doing, Jess Grenesis is doing stuff. And obviously, I, you, you, yeah. I, I forget as well that the Olympics was a massive deal to so many, of course, but equally David Beckham was hugely influential in us getting the bid back in 2005 and, and did an awful lot of work on it. So um, amazing. Like, and again, an absolute gentleman to, to everybody there, which I, I thought was brilliant. Amazing. Guys, this has been an absolute fantastic show. I'm going to end it. We haven't spoken much, much about United, but I'm going to end it and I'm going to ask what your score prediction is for the game against West Brom and Galbian. Um, I'll yeah. let you start as our guest, Greg, because I always pick on Meg. I always let Meg go first and she's always like, oh, you didn't give me time to it. So I'm going to let you go first on this one, Greg. What is your score prediction for the game on Saturday? Right, I'm, I'm going to go out of a relatively confident return from the international break and I'm going to say a 3-0 United win. Like Thank you. It. This is what I went. Where are you? This side. This is what I went for the other day. I'm bringing the confidence, and I'm still sticking with it. Greg said it as well now, so I'm not I'm not budging. We're going for a three 0 over here. Love that. So obviously, I, I still think we'll win. I think it'll be closer, but I think we'll win. I said a two one, and I'm going to stick that two one United because um, I don't fully trust us at the back. And when team City, and I think we struggle to break them down, but I do think we've got enough to beat West Brom. However. Being at home, it just it's that little niggle, you know, because obviously we haven't won at home for so long in the league. But I do yeah. think we will get, I do think we'll, we will get the win on Saturday. I'm just buzzing for club football to be back. To be honest with you, I'm so excited. And, and, and I, after watching United play once, I'm like, oh, when's the next international break? Because I'm sick of watching. Yeah. This break. But right now, <laughs> I'm thinking I cannot wait for it to come back. A uh, twisted thank you. This is Lady Jesus Share quality bottle of wine and Brini when you beat the new way. <laughs> yes. To be fair, if you're celebrating beating West Bromwich Albion with bottles of wine and that, then you know that we're, we're, we're struggling. <laughs> to be fair, we should well, be beating it, it, Isn't that interesting as well, how, how things have changed? When we sort of talked about what, uh, what's going on at the club, whatever else now, it is really interesting how the mindset, I think, is changing slightly, isn't it? We're, we're in a situation where we're, we're, not, we're not as confident as we once were. I think that's part of the shame of, of what's sort of currently going on. We need to get back into a... A, a run of games and a run of form where that confidence is back in, where other teams are coming to play and thinking, how? I mean, this is what they always talk about. Players of, of, of yonder year would always talk about it was turn up at Old Trafford and wonder how many they were going to beat us by today. That's yeah. what we need to get yeah. back to. Um, and I think it's a shame that we're all sort of going, all oh, right. I mean, it could be a could be a banana skin, um, but uh, well, at least we're confident it's going to be three now. I think I think I think that's a decent prediction for sure. 
you know what, three points, I'll take it regardless whether it's a one nil win. As long as we get the win, I think that's really important at home as well. But it's like you mentioned, it's the lack of consistency at the moment, isn't it? It's such a yo-yo team. It depends what what mood the players turn up in. International break, I'm just hoping that we're coming back fresh, fit and hungry. And like I said, that Everton win as well just before. Let's hope we can build on that now. So, yeah, fingers crossed. But it's been an absolutely amazing show. We said it'd be about 45 minutes. We've gone over an hour. But I could sit here all night and listen to some of the stories. Right. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming on and thank you for taking the time out as well to come and join us this evening. No, thank you so much for having me on. And I'll happily come. If you ever want me back, I'll happily come back on again and we can chat about a few other bits and bobs. Definitely, we'll definitely hold you to that, of course. And Meg, thank you for taking the time to come and join us as well. No problem at all. A huge thank you to Greg. Um, some of those stories are just incredible. Incredible. It, it's so nice to to listen to to what you've just said. So thank you very much for coming on. Well, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, so thank you to everyone in the chat. Greg, you know what? In the chat as well, it's been so positive. Everyone's been bigging you. Everyone's been mesmerised. I did. Act- so I did really see. Good. A comment earlier on, by the way, that said Greg for PM. Now, <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> I mean, you've got my vote. It's a strange if thing you... happen. <laughs> it's it's uh, pretty funny. Strange. So, well, yeah, I mean, it's true. You know what? I'm in. Right, so I'm throwing me at in. Here we go. I've got three votes. <laughs> Brilliant. You <laughs> can't get rid of a, a spider the size of a ten pence piece, but it can run the country. Definitely, it's well, easy. You know what? <laughs> Hopefully, you would have some form of aid or something who uh, could do the spider side of things. But who knows? No, no, no. Definitely, I, I, I'm a complete moron. So, I mean, I don't think um, you'd want me. But although maybe compared to the current, anyway, no. But um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> <It's not laughs> <okay. laughs> <laughs> but guys please hit the like button if you're new hit the sub button as well I'd really appreciate it we're so close to 15,000 subscribers now so please hit the sub there go and follow Meg and Greg on Twitter and Instagram as well go and check out their socials I will pop them in the description all that's left to say is keep smiling have a lovely rest of your evening take care and we'll be back very soon